of people come up here and they like to talk to you about their successes because people can learn from people's successes and as long as you're comfortable speaking in front of other people, it can be kind of fun to be the expert on the stage. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. And if when my, my presentation comes up, the title says, what's not on my resume and what failure, why failure is key to leadership. Okay, so. Failure is a sticky, slippery word. We use it for lots of different things. We use it when we have life-altering losses. We use it for an idea that didn't quite pan out, okay? But what's consistent across most experiences of failure is the emotion of regret. So I want you to just pause for a minute because in my book, Living a Life with No Regrets, isn't living a life of courage. It's living a life with no reflection. So we're going to start while Jen pulls up these slides with you pulling out a writing device of your choosing, whatever that may be, the old style pen and paper that I like, or the newfangled you know, phones and laptops and such that I see many of you using today. I want you to take a minute and think about what are your top three failures in your life? What was the circumstances for the failure? And how did you overcome it? So my first story is a story about my first company called Kyla's Keepsakes. And uh, it is start, the story starts in, in the 1990s. I was working in a marketing role at Intel Corporation. I'd had my first baby girl and really wanted to spend more time at home with her. And you've probably heard the expression, if you do what you love, you'll never work another day in your life, right? Everybody heard that? Well, at the time, I loved scrapbooking. Scrapbooking was paper and glue and scissors at the time, okay? And so I, I thought, ah, I work at a technology company. We need to make scrapbooks digital. Digital scrapbooks would be so awesome because, you know, all this paper and, and glue and stuff, is, it, it takes a lot of space to store all that. So I used what I learned in my MBA, and I went out and did a business plan. And then I learned what I did, uh, I, I used what I learned at my Intel marketing job, and I got product feedback from potential clients. And a couple of years had passed, and I, I got... Uh, in conversations with a buyer at Joanne Fabrics who had gotten into the scrapbooking industry and wanted to differentiate themselves. And with his support and uh, some fast talking with my husband, I decided to take the big plunge. I invested about between ten and twenty thousand dollars of my own money, hired a software development company, got the packaging and the logo and the point of sale materials, got that all ready. It took about three months. And along the way, I'd been given that buyer updates. Well, by the end of the project, I called and was informed that he no longer worked for the company. So I talked to the new buyer who was not interested in anything digital and didn't even like scrapbooking. So here I am sitting with a garage full of CDs because digital at the time was CDs, internet was not what it is today. Um, and I was, I was so scared. My big opportunity, right, my breakthrough customer had disappeared. But I figured I had a good product and I just needed to work harder to be successful. So at the time I had, uh, there, were, there were scrapbook companies on every corner and I was living in Arizona. So I visited every single scrapbook store in Arizona, personally. Most of them were small mom and pop shops. Um, and they, they barely had computers to you know, do their own business, let alone was not very supportive of having computers to do scrapbooking. So then I came to Utah, scrapbooking capital of the world, right? Went to several trade shows, had my product for sale, talked to the media, tried to get articles published, bought a national mailing list, sent out a mailer to uh, all the scrapbook stores in the nation, which at the time were about 5,000 of them. So at the end of five years, 
I had a few, I had a handful of customers. I still had a garage full of CDs. And the technology had moved on enough that I and had made enough money to reinvest in getting it up to be up to date and compatible with the, the latest Windows operating system. So I donated the CDs and I closed that chapter and closed that business with a huge sigh of relief and some sadness and while still working at Intel. So this was my first failure. And you know, they always say, there's no failures, there's just learning experiences. So what did I learn from this experience? Well, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself. I learned that I'm a terrible salesperson. To this day, I struggle with being a salesperson. And I'm c continually trying to develop that part of myself, but I'm still not very good at it. Um, I learned you have to have enough funding to um, do more than the product development. So when I started, I was not funded enough. I had not thought about getting good funding. And the, the thing I also learned was part of success is about being lucky with the timing. How many people today do digital scrapbooking? Oh, well, maybe you guys don't do any scrapbooking. But the market nowadays, you know, 20-some years later, uh, is all digital. I was too early. Okay? And I wasn't well funded enough to continue and to adapt with the industry. So that's, that's the traditional things. But I'm not here to talk about just what I learned from my failures. I want to continue with the bigger picture, which is my, uh, my experience with businesses has continued. The next thing that I did was a build to suit company with my husband, where um, I don't know if you know what that is. It's a uh, it's a way to build custom homes for people one at a time. And it was, uh, the business was called D&D Homesteads. We did that in Arizona and made a ton of money until the housing market crashed and we went bankrupt. So that loss was about 10 times the initial investment of my first business. But we're like, okay, we, we survived that. So what are we gonna do next? We're gonna buy a Cold Stone Creamery. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit more safe and secure, right? It's a franchise that has a good brand name. Did all the, the due diligence that, that you do when you buy a business. We ended up signing the dotted line about a week before 9-11. Yeah, so you, you guys have probably lived through the Great Recession and you know how businesses tanked and the first three years was really, really hard. We didn't make any money. We basically worked for free. But we hung in there ended up turning it around, having it be a profitable business, and we actually sold this one for a, a modest gain, which is way better than the last three you know, times when we lost money. And now I'm in a consulting business, which is about break even. So I'm not losing a ton, I'm not making a ton, and I'm learning how to b grow my clientele. So the moral of the story that I want to share with you is that failure is, and success, neither are linear. Okay. I thought I had been so successful in my college years and at Intel that that success would easily translate into the being an entrepreneur and being a business person. For one reason or another, that's not been the case, okay? I also thought that, okay, you fail a couple times, you learn along the way, and pretty soon you're gonna get led into this exclusive call, club called success, right? And it doesn't work that way either, okay? So keep that in mind as you go forward, but more importantly, the leadership lessons that I've, I've learned in these experiences that I've applied to other experiences are strength. First one is strength. You know, that first failure was so hard. But you, you gain perspective. It's like you know you're not going to die. You know you're going to live through the outcome. And you become a lot more resilient and, and a bit able to take bigger risks because you have less fear. This is a picture of Bear Lake. And my second story is a leadership failure. So fast forward from, from my, my uh, marketing days at Intel, and now I'm the director of HR communications. Um, I am leading a global organization. I have about 100 people spread across nine countries. It was the biggest job I'd ever had. And after the organization had been uh, formed for about a year, things were not going very well. 
there was a lot of infighting. There was a lot of chaos that, uh, that, and confusion that our customers we were trying to serve were not being happy with. So uh, my big solution was let's bring all the leaders together, my management team that were spread all over the country, because you know, you've heard how hard it is to, to, to do business virtually. Let's, like, let's be face to face. Let's have a big management meeting and figure this stuff out. And um, my big idea was to go to the USU Bear Lake Training Center, because I'd been there before in my college days. It was a great, great facility. And I knew the power of team building when you're cooking and socializing as well as working, you know, in, in kind of close quarters for a number of days. My admin at the time had also been to the facility, and she was so excited to go back there. We both had really good memories there. So we got so caught up in planning for this big meeting that I wasn't really listening to what my team was saying. They had, a uh, few of them had, you know, brought up in one-on-one -on -one meetings or in team meetings, well, what about this concern? What about that concern? And I thought we had addressed them and they were gonna be on board. Little did I know they were talking amongst themselves and was trying everything they could to change the plan. So here it is the Friday before the big meeting. People are on planes and in the air already. And HR comes to me, said that one of my team members had escalated the issue as a safety concern and that they were requesting that I cancel the meeting. Fortunately, I was, even though devastated and felt betrayed and ashamed and angry and all these other emotions, I was quick enough on my feet to save the meeting and say, no, we'll just have it in the office rather than we'll just cancel the, the location. So I spent that, that weekend really pondering what had happened. And my first, my first response was I wanted to blame my team. How could they do this to me? How could they not be more direct? Why didn't they just tell me that, that they thought it was a safety concern? Nobody told me it was a safety concern, right? Why did they have to escalate it over my head? And I thought that would make myself feel better. It didn't. So I, I spent some time with a good friend. I realized, realized that I had good intentions and I had done everything I thought I needed to do. I had worked hard. I had nothing to be ashamed of. I needed to let go of the self-doubt. I needed to let go of the self-concern and think about this from a bigger perspective. If this face-to-face -face was a failure that they weren't telling me about what else was failing and why weren't they telling me about it, right? So I showed up on Monday and everybody's sitting in their chairs nervous. And I, I welcomed them to the meeting and I put down the prepared agenda and I basically thanked them. I thanked them for, for having the courage to escalate the issue. I thanked them for the learning opportunity that they're giving me and for the ability to role model how I wanted the organization to respond to failures and mistakes in the future. We were building a new business model. It was highly complex. Nobody had ever done that before. We were going to make mistakes. There were gonna be failures, both mine as a new leader and theirs as people in this new organization trying to figure things out. But we could not be successful if we weren't able to talk about them. And I had inadvertently set the tone of the organization to say failure was not acceptable. I did not like surprises. Everybody knew that. I still don't like surprises. Ask any of my kids. But what that, mean, what that meant to them was, oh, we can't tell her when things are going bad. And that was opposite from the truth. And so we had a, an awesome meeting. We came together as a strong management team. We ended up turning the organization around and this is a career and personal relationship highlight for many of us. Uh, we refer to this uh, as the Bear Lake coup, is a, a favorite story of ours, um, and it was a turning point. Um, and so the, the moral of the story is that the leader sets the tone of the organization, either purposely or inadvertently. I had, like I said, I had set the tone that failure was not an option, regardless of how hard you worked. Um, and uh, my favorite author is Brene Brown. I don't know if you're familiar with her. 
She's a professor at uh, Houston. There is no innovation, creativity without failure. And so for the leaders that stifle failure, you'll be nothing more than the also rans, okay? So my personal uh, leadership lessons from this story is, you know, having integrity, standing up and owning who you are and what, what mistakes you've made has a powerful impact on your people and your organization. And having empathy for yourself as well as for your team. Because if I had not been nice to myself, if I did not have that trusted friend to get through to the place where I was not in self-doubt, I couldn't then have gone on to think about my team. So you're only as nice to others as you can be to yourself. Okay, so this next picture, and this is why I was so wanting to have these slides shown to you because this story just isn't the same without the pictures. This is me at my dad's birthday party. I've got a house full of family. I fell asleep in the kitchen holding a cup of coffee. My mom took this picture and she likes to make fun of me. Okay, this next picture was taken a few years later at my daughter's fifth birthday party. Again, house full of family and screaming kids this time. Do you see a trend? These are only two of many pictures I could show you, but I'll stop with these two. So this last story is a story of personal failure. And this story starts actually here at Salt Lake Community College. When I was a senior in high school, I was here at an awards banquet with the other high achievers destined for success. And we had to stand up and introduce ourselves and say where we saw ourselves in 20 years. So, I was the first person in my family, in my extended family, who had ever gone to college or been to college or wanted to go to college. First person in my neighborhood as well. So I really didn't have a lot of perspective, but I stood up there and I proudly said, I see myself as a company executive someday, probably living in a bigger city than Salt Lake City. What I didn't say, but what, what always went along with that idea was a big house, fancy cars, expensive vacations. That was what I thought success was. Fast forward 20 years, I'm a director at Intel Corporation, traveling the world, which was both a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing because I loved the adventure and I've seen many, many parts of the world. And I loved getting to know my people better, but I missed my family. I had four kids at home at the time, from the ages of three to 13. I missed soccer games, homework projects, music performances, and that really tore me up. But I was successful, right? This is what I was supposed to be doing. This is what I worked my whole life for. So <clears throat> I, uh, I was pretty good at my job. I liked my team. I was well respected. I loved the company I worked with, but I had this nagging feeling that there was something wrong because I didn't feel successful. Hell, I didn't even feel alive. I was always exhausted all the time, even at the fifth birthday party. As you can see, I slept through many of life's little precious gifts and moments. So I was at a team building event where it was uh, some facilitators, consultants came in to say, how do we you know, pump up the energy of this team and, and let us do this exercise where we evaluated the times in our life when we were the most excited and the most hopeful for the future and had enough personal energy. And through that exercise, I learned that my personal definition of success was peace, freedom, and joy. So the big house and the big family meant that I had no freedom. And I was too tired to have any peace or joy. So while I was publicly successful, I was personally a failure. I would have continued in that, though, I'm sure, until I died or retired. But Intel gave me a gift and decided to leave Utah. They moved the operation. I could have moved with the company and kept my job and my big paycheck, but I had a decision to make. I had a turning point in my life. And you know, there's 
a few times in your life where you have windows. And, and when you have those windows, you, you can see completely different paths ahead of you. And this was one of them for me. And it took a lot of courage, but I decided to obviously leave Intel and stay in Utah and made the decision based on what I personally valued. So the moral of the story is that um, failure is only defined by your, by, by what you think is successful. Okay? And try not to live your life trying to meet somebody else's expectations and somebody else's definition of success. Because you can have what you thought you wanted, a big house, fancy cars, expensive vacations, and not be happy. And what is the purpose of success if it doesn't include happiness? Okay, so that's the moral of the story. The leadership lessons that I've taken away from this story is um, to have, have character, to know who you are, to know what your values are, to make decisions based on those values, because you become a lot more authentic of a person, and that authenticity people can see and are willing to follow. Okay, the other thing is to have courage. Courage is not necessarily not being scared. It's knowing that there are risks, there's you know, no promise to the outcome, and taking the step anyway. All of these lessons, you can hit it again, it are what I personally learned through these three stories. And I feel like uh, one thing is these are traits that you'd want in a leader, any leader. But they're also traits that you would want in your team members. And team members tend to follow the behaviors of their leaders, more so than you can ever imagine. And so start building your muscles today. Seth Godin says that leadership is valuable because it's so scarce. And why is it scarce? It's because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to have an idea that may fail. It's uncomfortable to hold out in a negotiation and not settle. These things have value, but they take experience, and experience helps build that strength. So, back to the questions I started with. What have been your three failures? Are they failures based on your definition of success or somebody else's? Did you have a hard time coming up with some failures? Does that mean that you're more risk averse than you need to be and you need to dip your toe in the water a little bit and start having these experiences? Or is it because you're caught up into the blame game that we all grew up in saying, oh, it's not my fault. I don't make failures. I'm smarter than that. I've been there, done that. It doesn't work. So what caused those failures? Was it somebody else's fault? Did, did you deflect? Did you minimize? Okay, these are things to really think about because if you take the opportunities, the gifts that your failures can give you, you will become a better person and a stronger leader. So the last question was kind of a trick question. How did you overcome your failures? In my humble opinion, you don't overcome them. You don't conquer them. You incorporate them. They become your strengths. So in closing, my message here is that it's what you do with your failure that defines you as a person who can lead and that others will and will want to follow. Because what you, ma what you know matters, but honestly, who you are matters more. And it's through these trials that your courage is tested and your values are forged. And we've been told that we should live with no regrets. I disagree with that. I think you use your regrets and you uh, use them to refine yourself, okay? What I found, in addition to what I've shared with you today, is that I regret most of the times when I didn't have the courage to be kind. 
when I didn't have the courage to stand up for myself, when I didn't have the courage to say no, when I didn't have the courage to set boundaries. And so I challenge you all to go off and be brave. Go and be brave and be strong leaders. That's all I have for you today. This is the first time I've told these stories in public. I hope that this was meaningful for you. It's been quite meaningful for me to go back into my life and dig these things up. So with that, thank you for having me today. What was the most important thing for me when I picked a franchise? Well, I wanted something that I personally liked, so a product that I personally liked. I also, uh, so we, we evaluated a Quiznos uh, sandwich shop as well as a Cold Stone as well as a, uh, like a storage facility. So we wanted to have, of course, good cash flow. And I, I chose something that, or we, my husband and I, chose something that we thought would be easy. Because, you know, ice cream doesn't spoil like tomatoes and lettuce do, right? It's going to be easy. We were wrong. It was not easy. But that was the criteria that we used. And, you know, we did eat a lot of profit the first year. But. <laughs> So the process of buying a franchise probably varies for each franchisor. I can tell you the process that we went through was, uh, first we had to send in enough uh, financial information to know that, that they knew we could you know, keep the business afloat for two years should there not be any cash flow. Uh, so there's some pretty stringent uh, financial requirements. And then they had us go through a personality evaluation, which I thought was really interesting because um, at the time, they felt like the brand uh, needed a certain personality to deliver the brand experience. You know, and one of the questions in the personality assessment was, what do you think about kids? Which I thought was really an interesting question, but as I was talking to the area director, he said, well, you know, if you own an ice cream store and you don't like kids, you're not going to be a very good owner. So personality test. Um, and then they made us work actually in the franchise for two weeks full time. So we had our, you know, we had the basic training that any new crew members would have. We scooped ice cream, we washed dishes, we scrubbed the floor and the toilets and talked to the customers. And at the end of that, they said, okay, do you still want to buy it? Because you know, first they want to make sure they wanted us, and then they wanted to make sure that we had a realistic expectation of what the work was before we made the decision that, yes, we do want to buy it. So that was the process that we went through. And then they had continuing training. We spent another week uh, down at their corporate office to learn more of their business principles and marketing and systems, um, and then yearly training and then quarterly training. So that was the process that we went through. They had pros and cons. Um, let me start with that and then I'll answer your question, which is which would I prefer, either starting my own business or a franchise? Um, the pros of the franchise was so much, that's all the support that they gave you. You know, they were experts in marketing, experts in product design. Um, they had a national brand, so there was not as much, you know, heavy lifting to get people to know what you do and why you do it. Um, but with that additional overhead comes cost. So you pay for all that experience, as well as it limits your freedom. So there are certain you know, hours we had to be open, and days we had to be open, and products we had to carry, and products we couldn't carry. And so you know, they have a, a quarterly audits that you would get in trouble for. And if you didn't meet the requirements, then they could take your franchise away. And so it didn't feel a ton different than working in a corporation, other than the financial risk was all on you. So um, that was, that's kind of the franchise experience. The owning your own business is a lot harder because you have a brand that nobody knows, you offer products that nobody knows, and you're not as well funded and you're not as well researched, but it's a ton more freedom. So I think it depends on um, what type of business you're in um, and also what, where you personally are thrive, what kind of environment you personally thrive in. I kind of like the more structured approach. My husband, however, is a complete rebel. So he kind of struggled in the whole cor franchise, corporate. Now he's a math teacher, so I don't know. Seems like a lot of structures there. <laughs>
That is a, an age-old question, which is networking. How do you reach uh, decision makers and you know executives when you're not an executive yourself? You know, the, the short answer is I'm not very good at it, and I've not been very successful at it personally. Um, I, I am a member of an organization right now called Corporate Alliance, which facilitates those meetings, which has been very helpful and very useful. So um, I found that to be a lot more expensive and a lot more uh, helpful than a, a Chamber of Commerce, but Chambers of Commerce do that as well. Um, but also um, getting involved in volunteer opportunities can help you rub shoulders with people. And the, and the principle that's really, I think, been the most powerful in, in my life has been um, to, to let go of, of, of relationship arrogance which is, oh, I want to talk to the CEO, so I don't want to spend any time talking to the admin, which is not the case, especially if you're at a social event or if you're at a you know, Habitat for Humanity volunteer opportunity or whatever. You don't know who these people know. You don't know who their family members are. You don't know who their neighbors are. And you need to treat everybody with you know, unconditional positive regard and respect. And through that, you will become a person that people will want to know regardless of your position. To be qualified for this franchise, it needed to be personal funds. Again, I think that a lot of franchisors have different requirements. Uh, but yeah, we didn't, uh, we didn't have a bank loan. Yeah. OK, leading globally. Well, first, leading, leading is um, getting work done with and through people, OK? Um, and that's true regardless of the organization and where they're at. I think the complication that comes with leading uh, in a global environment is first language, which is obvious if they speak different, different languages. But even where at Intel Corporation, the company language was English. And so you had to be proficient in English to even have a job there. So we all spoke English. But the understanding of the actual words very differently, greatly between countries, even between departments. You can use the same word and it'll mean something different. So one of the things that I found really helpful is making sure that we were communicating clearly and that we understood the language that each other was using. And I have a funny recent example of that. My daughter was telling us about the preppy kids at school yesterday. And I'm like, preppy, what do you mean by preppy? And she's like, oh, mom, that's such an old term. Everybody knows what preppy is. I'm like. I'm just checking to see if it still means the same thing to you as it did to me, because I'm a lot older than you, and the meaning of words change, right? And that is so true when you're leading people from other cultures and other countries. So be really clear about your language. I think the other thing that was uh, difficult or challenging and, and, and fascinating and interesting is the national cultural impact on how people respond to challenge, fear, success, uh, co competition, it varies widely. So when you're dealing with somebody in India and you're giving them, this is what you do really well, they'll go off and say, oh, I'm ready for a promotion. She really likes me. I'm doing better than anything, anybody else. Whereas you say that to somebody in China, they don't tell anybody. You know, so it's, it's, it's really different. So really understanding not only the personal differences, because we all have differences the way we were raised, but the cultural, you know, country differences and how people respond to those key things were big. And then um, what I found is that uh, they all have a lot of assumptions about Americans that nobody wants to talk about. But it's really helpful in one-on-one -on -one building relationships, whether in person or on the phone, to say, you know, what, what are your assumptions? What do you, how do you see me? It's like, I know how I see me, but how do you see me? And to, and to get that to a place that's real and honest. So I think those are the three main things I'd say. So the question is whether or not I had done any research before I got thrown into that position and just went with it. Um, a little bit of both, honestly. In working at a global company, you work with people. I had worked with people in those countries beforehand and became friends with a few of them along the way, so I had some idea. Um, there's a really good management training curriculum at Intel Corporation, which includes um, cultural awareness. 
So there was reading material and some discussions that went on to to learn about it from a, a macro level. But um, one of the things that I did before I traveled to their country is I would do my research to know what was going on in the country at the time so I was relevant and I didn't come in as an arrogant American that thinks that we're the only country in the world, right? And I could talk to them about what was happening in their news and in their leadership. And that went, that was huge. And, and for me, I just like to be able to talk to people on an intelligent basis. So I didn't, I didn't do it necessarily to win points with them. I did it for myself to feel like I could have something to, to converse with not only my team, but the people in the on the bus and whoever else I met along the way because I wanted to set a, a good uh, experience with American. I mean, as you're out traveling around, your people are, are using their experiences with you to project on the rest of us. The question is, how did I find a mate because I was so busy? <laughs> Something like that. Um, I met my husband in college before I got so busy, so that's part of it. Um, but I think the deeper question that you're asking is about whether the relationships you have are like a business relationship and how that how that translates. Because not only were are we married and have the personal contract, but we were business partners in a couple different businesses, right? And so, I mean, I can speak to that probably. I don't know if that's going to be at the root of your question or not. But um, I have known husband and wives be in business together and be really successful. I've known them to be very unsuccessful. I would say that my personal experience is right in the middle. So we both left college and went to work for Intel Corporation. He is an engineer and I was over in marketing. So we worked for the same company and we had a lot of the same context and a lot of the same you know, corporate culture came into our house, if you will, right? Which was very helpful. Uh, we loved it. And we both loved Intel Corporation, and that worked really well. And when he left Intel and um, went to do something different, I felt very sad that we weren't carpooling together. We didn't have a conversation about, oh, this CEO did this, and did you hear about that? And what about this new HR policy? And I mean, because we had had that in common, and we had really enjoyed that. And I think it, had, it helped our our personal relationship at home because we had that same approach to problems that you learn in the corporate world and it was the same. So I think that really strengthened it and I missed it when it was gone. Um, and then we bought the franchise together and had to work side by side in a business and, and struggled honestly for eight years to have a good um, separation of labor um, because it's, it's easier at home because there's kind of traditions of what the separation of labor should be. And, and at, at work, my expectation was, hey, you should do what you're good at, and I should do what I'm good at, and then you know, we'll divide and conquer. And it was like, oh, no, 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 no. That wasn't how it was going to work, right? And so it, it took eight years, and then we never really worked it out. It was really hard. So I'm not saying don't go in business with your spouse. I'm just saying kind of understand your expectations going into it. Um, and that's probably the same for a personal relationship, too, because um, I wouldn't have been able to do the businesses and all the you know, business failures I've had had I not had a supportive husband. And he was you know, able to be the, with me along the way. And, that, and had I had a different husband, it would have maybe worked out differently. So I think that the, uh, the, you're at the time of your life, many of you, where you're making these big life decisions, and spouse is a big one. So the question is, is, was being a woman put me in a disadvantage? Um, the answer is yes and no. And I'll start with the yes. So my business partner in my consulting business is a man who used to work for me at Intel Corporation. And when we go to networking events here in Utah and meet with other executives, they always think I'm his secretary or his wife. So, and I can't even tell you how many times this has happened. And so, with that as the assumption going in, there's kind of a, um, uh, a deficit you have to make up quickly. And what I find is that deficit is, 
deficit is hard to make up as a woman because if you come in as an expert, you come in as, and, and are seen as too aggressive and a know-it-all, right? But if you come in as um, a, in a more of a, a softer or a more relatable way, saying, you know, being a manager since my first job flipping hamburgers, which is a very relatable versus saying, oh, I was director at Intel Corporation, you know, uh, it, you don't get the same level of respect. And so there's a very, very tight wire that women work, walk in the business world to be successful. And it changes all the time and it's, and it's, but it's fun at the same time. So at Intel Corporation, I never felt like being a woman was a disadvantage. Um, in fact, when I was in marketing, I was often the only woman on a team. I was often the only one tra woman traveling. I had the bathroom to myself because nobody else was, had a cubicle on my floor. And I didn't find that to be a disadvantage at all. But I think the difference was the culture. The culture at Intel um, was invested in heavily by the management. It valued diversity. And it said, it taught everybody, you don't see age, you don't see gender, you don't see nationality, you see results. And that's how everybody was evaluated. Made it hyper competitive. And there were a lot of people that didn't, didn't like that about it. But for me personally, I thought it was the great equalizer. So I think that the answer is it depends on where you're at. Uh, 